we were working on ER, which I was going to direct as a feature film, that Michael Crichton had written about his own experiences in medicine when he was an intern. And I asked him one day what he was doing next, what kind of book was he writing? And he said, all I can tell you, because all my books are secret, this book is about dinosaurs and DNA. And it changed my life because I immediately lost interest in ER as a movie and started pumping him for news about what this was all about. And that was the beginning of evolving Jurassic Park into a film. It was the first time I remember openly defying my parents. Uh, I, I was about 15 years old, maybe 16, and I was grounded from seeing movies for several weeks. And a friend of mine worked at the movie theater and told me, you know, we're gonna screen Jurassic Park at midnight with just the theater employees, if you can get here. Uh, so I snuck out of the house, and I don't encourage other young people to do it, but uh, it was a very indelible memory, and it's one of the most thrilling films ever made. But I didn't just want to infuse the spirit of Jurassic Park into this movie. It was the feeling that I had watching a lot of Stevens movies and the other Amblin movies as a young kid. Ready and action! This movie is more about bringing back the feeling that all of those movies gave me. And it's not something that you can define necessarily, and it's not something you can manufacture. It's about infusing it with a soul. It just makes you feel like you want to be on that adventure with those characters. So we're going to go over, over here. here. We have a room set up mm -hmm. with some art. Mm -hmm. I got a call from Frank Marshall after I directed a very small film called Safety Not Guaranteed. And Steven saw it. And we came in and we spoke for a little while. And we talked, you know, not about necessarily even what this film was going to be, but uh, about why people love this franchise, why people love these stories, and, and what are the elements that have connected with people over 22 years that we wanted to try and recapture for a new generation. He had a story to tell. He didn't just come in and say, I'd like to render my services directing the fourth installment. He came in with an actual story, and just on paper, even before there was a screenplay, his story worked. The eye goes right to the uh, visitor center, the mm -hmm. central visitor center. We also made sure to put a fence so yeah. you don't mm -hmm. get eaten if you go swimming on this side. Right. Stephen had had the idea to make it a fully functioning theme park. And then the other idea that he brought forward, which I thought was fascinating, is let's make a movie about our relationship with animals on our planet right now, but replace them with dinosaurs. Blue! Blue! Watch it! And what if humans and dinosaurs have been coexisting for a while and we get to go to the next level of that relationship? There were a lot of really interesting themes and ideas in that, and so we just grabbed onto that and ran with it as far as we could. He's always been a fan of the characters I write, and I've always been a fan of the stories he comes up with and the plotting and structure he can do. And so when we get together, it all seems to work out and create this cool, unique tone that each of us on our own don't possess, but when we come together, we can make it work. You made a genetic hybrid, raised it in captivity. She does not even know what she is. She will kill everything that moves. They begin making hybrids of, of different dinosaurs, combining them in a way that they never naturally would have been combined, meaning it's a complete manifestation of the hubris of man. Indominus wasn't bred. She was designed. Anyone that knows the Jurassic Park franchise knows that this is not a good thing. But it's not just dinosaurs running around and something goes wrong. Colin and Derek put a real point of view into this one. You don't learn anything about these animals except what you want to know. You made them, and now you think you own them. Well, we do own them. We're sitting on a gold mine. Colin has opinions about corporations doing everything for money and pushing and pushing and pushing the envelope as far as you can. Did you close the deal? I did. Verizon Wireless presents the Indominus Rex. Oh, that's terrible to hear. I stay involved in the script, in the shaping of the story. And then if the director invites me into the process, I don't like to impose myself, but if the director invites me into the process, you know, and shows me the storyboards and the previs, which Colin did, I love that. My confidence was so high in what Colin was going to achieve. On a movie like this, especially with a director who's coming off a $750,000 movie, you would assume they would say, meet your cinematographer and meet your costume designer, and they didn't. I was able to 
choose my team. There's going to be a version where we go out in there with him, but we also want to do a version where we're behind the bars. Yeah. And I think this is the behind so the bars. So this can cover that? Yeah, absolutely. Good, I think John Schwartzman has shot some of the more beautiful films that I've seen. And he got excited about it, and we came in right away. And you know, we're going to shoot this thing on film, or we're going to shoot 65 out in the jungle. And and so we got very excited, just as film nerds. And he's got one of the best teams in the business. And it was extremely collaborative. And I brought in Daniel Orlandi, uh, who actually had worked with Ron Howard on a lot of movies, and who Bryce knew very well. And Ed Vero, you know, he and I worked very, very closely in trying to design a world that's not sci-fi, it's not completely out there, a world of the future. And I think that the movie has a very distinct, not just a look, but the way that Jurassic World feels, it succeeds at my number one goal of the movie, which is to have a kid either look at the website or see the film and say, no, you have to take me there. That's real, right? We're going. Welcome to Jurassic World. Well, I initially went about casting, I think in the same way Steven has gone about casting the other films in the franchise, which is I picked the best character actors available. But you're running, you're running, you're running, you're running, and then when you get right here, oh, you see it, and you go boom, and it goes right at, right at, at that time, I wasn't aware that one of the great character actors that I chose was going to become a hugely successful movie star in the in But he the wasn't year. when you cast him. Not at all. No, yeah. I just cast a great actor. No, hold your fire. The 12 imps and these animals are never going to trust me again. I thought he had the chops for this, and Colin believed in him, and I really believed in him, too. So it was a bit of a risk. And of course, when Guardians of the Galaxy came out, we all thought we were really smart. <laughs> Even though we didn't make Guardians of the Galaxy, they made us look really smart. Here we are in the Raptor paddock. This is the first scene that we meet Owen, and we also see Owen uh, trying to tame these wild raptors. In fact, that's exactly what they'll look like uh, when the movie's done. Yo. When you, uh, Colin's my kind of director. He was like, look, you can't tell anybody, but your character is going to basically be training raptors ultimately for military applications. And I was like, OK, I'm in. <laughs> that sounds badass. Ready, three, two, one. It's a lot of running and jumping and leaping, punching, a lot of action hero moments. But for me, the biggest challenge is to not be goofy, because it's my natural instinct to be a goofball. And Ty gave me a nice big hug, because he's a sweet kid. And I was like, oh, Ty, <laughs> he snapped his neck. <laughs> and so before every take, I would have to do this little ritual to be like, don't turn into a dumbass halfway through this take. Where we have you in reacting to that, and that whole roof is going to come down. And then you guys are going to come out this way as this Jeep smashes into this wall. OK. OK? No rehearsal one take, right? Always. Yeah. Two no. Bryce Dallas Howard, I think, is one of the best actresses that we have. And she is absolutely gorgeous and incredible in the movie. And it was so exciting to work with her. The Indominus Rex, our first genetically modified hybrid, a new species built from scratch. So many great, important things come from technological advancements. But one can become myopic when one doesn't step back and look at the bigger picture. What are the greater implications of this? What are the, um, what are the moral implications of this? And that is what is happening right now at Jurassic World. And Claire is responsible for the park. The implant will shock it if it gets too close to a perimeter fence. To me, it's Claire's movie. She starts off pretty straight-laced, corporate, very uptight somewhat. It's all about meeting deadlines and margins and profits, and that's how she thinks. Evacuate the island. We'd never reopen. But she ends the movie in a different place where she started. And everyone, when I'm throwing, just a heads up, I wasn't hired for my throwing skills, so just, I don't want anyone to get clocked like, in the eye. When I was running with the flare, and my shirt was gone, and my skirt was ripped up to here, and I'm super sweaty and filthy, I was just like, man, Claire has come so far in a 24-hour period. She has just really grown. I'm just really proud of Claire. <laughs> and you're sure there's nobody else who can fly a helicopter? We don't need anyone else. Irfan Khan, Omar Sy, 
both of the boys, Ty Simpkins, Nick Robinson. These are all great actors. B.D. Wong came back from the first film to play his role again. And I found that all of these people just really wanted to be there. I just thought the idea was great. You know, we've never seen a full functioning park. And I was just very excited about that. I'm like, oh man, that's so cool. Everyone has had that moment where I've seen that little kid come on in their eyes and they're just like, this, this is like playtime. This is like, this is the best. Did you guys meet yet, by the way? Yeah, I just want to yeah. come say, hey, I'm Chris. Hi. How are you nice doing? Nice to meet you. Nice How are you? I'm well, Good. thank you. It's going to be fun. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. I'm sure. Sometimes you are on big set and you feel like you are, big, you are doing a big movie because you, 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 you feel the pressure. But here, it's not like that because of Colin. He's a special man. The way he deals with actors is, he finds a moment if he wants to nudge you. It's very delicate, and it has a lot of affection and friendliness. I really, really admire that, and as an actor, you need that. We've got Vincent D'Onofrio, who, when he saw how nasty his character got to be, he was really excited about it. You're going to watch the news tomorrow? There's going to be a story about how you all saved lives. No, better yet, how your animals saved lives. You know, you don't approach a role like this, play, you know, thinking of it as the villain. You know, I love my character, and I think my character is right, and everybody else is wrong. This is happening, with or without you. We have Jake Johnson, who is an old friend of Colin's and was the star of Colin's other movie. Open pack nine. <laughs> nine? You nuts? But we also have Lauren Lepkus, Judy Greer, Andy Buckley all wonderful actors that have uh, wanted to be a part of this movie. Colin keeps pointing out how exciting it is to be in this movie. He'll be like, you're in Jurassic World. This is Jurassic World, which I think is so cool. I'm like, it is. And even though the actors may be in a very small part, they really bring credibility and great talent to their roles. Cut. Awesome. Great. Thank you so much, you guys. That was amazing. We knew we had to go to a green environment in order to do the jungle work. We thought about Costa Rica. It doesn't really have the same kind of infrastructure that other places have. And it made a lot more sense to go to Hawaii. Now, is there any way we can do it so we can see this side of it? Can he hug on this side so we can see it? Yeah, so if the camera's there. We started our first day at the Honolulu Zoo, and that was going to be the petting zoo. And so we did a few things. We added a few things. We put some flags and stuff up. And then we had actors actually going around in gray suits, being the little baby dinosaurs. And kids were riding them and all that stuff. And that's kind of how we started our day. It was a fairly, fairly easy day. It gave the crew a chance to kind of coalesce and, you know, kind of work together for a little bit. I can still ride the Triceratops in 47 and a half inches. This place is for little kids. All right, cut. And cut. Oh, cut in. Not bad Not at bad all. all. Not bad all right. at all. And then we began to move out. Uh, we moved across the island up over to the Kualoa Ranch. And we did a whole bunch of stuff up there at the loading platform. What they didn't know at the time is that the soft tissue is preserved because of the iron in the dinosaur's blood generates free radicals. Good, now a little bit louder, a little bit more hyped up. What do you think is going to happen from you just staring at them? Look at them and laugh. <laughs> Cut. That's embarrassing. Cut. That's embarrassing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we had the gyrosphere loading platform, which we built out in Hawaii, and then this gyrosphere, which we didn't shoot that on a soundstage. We had these kids out in this thing traveling around through the jungle, uh, and that stuff to me feels completely real. I did feel like a real Jurassic Park because it was so jungly. I actually felt like I was lost or I was in Jurassic Park. You'll see like a blur, and then you'll see it's definitely a dinosaur, and then you see it's a dinosaur you've never seen before. And then they, uh, I can, when you get it. it was so beautiful and picturesque, and they had these giant gyrosphere balls on tracks, and they'd have a guy with a remote control 
driving it along and I'd just be pretending to maneuver it on the joystick. It was, it was pretty awesome. Go, 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 hey, go! Hey. And three, two, one, drop! Oh. Drop, oh. drop! Oh. Oh. It was pretty physical and, you know, I didn't do any training or anything before this and so we get here and I'm running down fields trying to keep up with an ATV while there's a supposed Indominus Rex behind us. Some of the days, it was a good workout, kicked my ass. I mean, Ty's in better shape than I am, probably, so I was out there, like, huffing and puffing. Ball pass, please. Ball pass. I didn't say we'd make it easy. We move over to gyro. We got to jump. Yeah. Basically, they're being chased by our big, bad dinosaur. One, two, come on. And they come across a waterfall, and that's their only way to get away from the dinosaur that's going to eat them. It's a 40-foot waterfall. The boys, they did all of the beauty shots at the edge, and then when we jumped, we had uh, two doubles uh, jump off. Action! We saw them go down in the water, and then we go back down below and have the boys go underneath the water and pop up like they did the jump themselves. They put me in a helicopter, and I could look down and see the Indominus Rex paddock, and I was like, man, I'm, whoa, I'm definitely in a Jurassic movie. <laughs> it was quite an introduction. The park needs a new attraction every few years to reinvigorate the public's interest. Kind of like the paddock, the idea was that way up country, away from prying eyes, they had built this large containment for this new asset that was not just a dinosaur, it was something else. So we had to build at least two walls of this paddock and a big observation room. We built a fairly big set. It's built out in the jungles in Kauai. We're talking 90-foot walls, maybe 150 yards wide, two stories. All the greens were brought in. I mean, it was amazing. Dinosaur. According to my watch, I just ran 65 miles an hour. Oh. Oh, sorry, my, my watch actually isn't capable of telling that, sorry. It's an estimate. Chris Pratt's going to give this message here. All right, listen. Cars, they fall from the sky sometimes. Right, thanks, Chris. OK, here we go, guys. We did a lot of practical stuff in the paddock, and so that was kind of the first time that we kind of started getting into a little bit of action on Jurassic World. Three, two, one, go! Oh. We're about to shoot Eric Edelstein, who is an unfortunate paddock worker who's about to be eaten. If you look like me, you're not going to make it to the end of the movie. It's a giant bummer. Three, two, one, go! Yeah, baby! We're not allowed to take video. <laughs> Don't tell anybody. Thank you so much. You really make me look like I know what I'm doing, and I couldn't do this without you. Thank you. Have an incredible three-day weekend. Thanks for letting me do that. Crazy. We'll get the moment when its head comes up, and she goes, <gasps> and that'll yeah. be its like, last breath of life moment. Are you with us, Coach? Yeah, absolutely. Colin we'll said, we need to have a working animatronic in this movie, because that's how this series of movies was built. What I wanted to do is use animatronics in a moment of intimacy. And we had a scene where they were going to come upon this fallen apatosaurus who was going to die. And so John Rosengrant and the guys from Legacy all came in with this extraordinary creature that they'd created. The day that we had our one animatronic dinosaur on the set was a very special day. It was sort of an homage and an honor to Stan Winston's wonderful animatronics on the first Jurassic. So it starts from the head, which Rich operates. The Trevor neck, takes the, head, the neck. neck. And I do the uh, breathing operations. Different bladders in the throat. And that's great. The exhale when she falls is beautiful. Did you hear that, Jason? Your exhale when she was falling was great. Okay. They only take three. And action. 
there's a very emotional scene where this thing is dying in my arms. And so it was really helpful to be holding something real that looks so real and is so beautiful. As puppeteers, it's making these things live and perform. It's bringing a character to life. Unfortunately, in this case, it's bringing one to its death. But in doing that, it's telling a story. There's something almost spiritual in that scene as the life leaves this animal. You don't feel like it's a robot ceasing to be operated. You feel like the spirit and the soul of this creature is going up into the sky. And that's a testament to those guys. I mean, that was, that was unbelievable. OK, she's starting to go. Not too much life left. She's going. One, two, three, six. She's gone. When Chris and I were getting to act with that animatronic dinosaur, there was such a performance. And getting to see that and interact with that, it was really emotional. I just wanted to take a say it was just such a huge uh, honor and a privilege for me uh, in my life as a filmmaker and as a person to have John Rosengrant legacy here doing this today. It meant a lot to me, and I know a lot of us. You can pick up their footprints, right? So you just move right in, right when he's done talking to you there, and you meet him. OK, let's try it again. We shot in Oahu and Kauai, and then we moved to New Orleans. It was about 50% Hawaii, 50% Louisiana. One of the interesting things about being here in New Orleans is we we're able to take advantage of not only the exteriors, but all of these great sets that we built here at the Big Easy Studios, which is on the NASA campus. We had six stages here that we had sets in. Uh, so we had the visitor center, and then we had connected to the visitor center is the genetics lab. So and this was all part of the Jurassic World experience. We also had the old visitor center. And the control room, which is where a lot of the movie takes place. Let me be as clear as I can. No velociraptors are going to be set loose on this island. <laughs> Yeah, you're, you're out of your mind. We were just shooting in control room, and so much is going on. And it's, it's big. All the computers, all the gadgets to control things. And then there's so many sections of the screen where you can see what's happening where in every corner of the park. Send a team of rangers out there. Bring them in. Security, we need a search and rescue in the valley. The control room is a place where you can really knit everything together. And so by the time we got there, we knew the movie, and we knew what we'd shot. And if there were things that we had to tweak to make sure that everything made sense, we could. She goes like, oh, I'm coming to you. Call a helicopter. I already, I already did. did. Just get here now. It's on the way. Just get here now. Yeah. We didn't do any reshoots on this movie. And I think the control room is what allowed us to cover all of the bases that a lot of people usually have to cover in reshoots, which is, ah, oh, this didn't work out the way we thought it was going to work out. Let's go fix that. There was nothing that we couldn't fix in that control room. Her tracking implant. She clawed it out. How would it know to do that? She remembered where they put it in. We not only did a lot of interior sets, but we were able to build some of our sets outside. We have the Raptor Arena, which we built. We had always been talking nebulously about the scene where Owen trains the Raptors. And I'm like, how do you train a Raptor? Like, what does that look like? Where are you? What building are you in? And so I had to kind of describe what it looked like and you know, I said it had this crisscross catwalk that's so many feet up above the ground and it's, you know, enclosed. And then I show up and it's exactly how I described it. Really, really a cool set. I mean, that thing is built of steel and cement. That is no joke. That thing could house dangerous animals for hundreds of years and would never break down. It's really, really sharp. And then we took over the abandoned Six Flags theme park. It was under six feet of water as a result of Hurricane Katrina. And so they let the park go, and it just sits there completely unused. But it happens to have a parking lot that's about the size of 10 football fields. So we went and built the, certainly the biggest set that I've ever built that just goes on and on and on.
what Colin was really going for, and I think that we hit this pretty well, was he wanted it not to be sort of Coney Island-like. He wanted it to feel more like a really hip, elegant destination. We wanted to create this high level of luxury. We wanted it to feel like a Fiji resort uh, with dinosaurs. One of the very fun things for me was my good friend Jimmy Buffett's restaurant, Margaritaville, is sort of the marquee restaurant there on the main street. We put in Winston's, which was shout to Stan Winston. There were a lot of little buried things like that. You develop the set and you build it and there's this long design curve and building curve and then all of a sudden there's 800 extras walking around. The most we ever had was a thousand, but we dressed several thousand because they, you know, every day we had new people. They wanted new people all the time. Please keep it quiet so that the crew can continue to work. We are rehearsing inside. Thank you very much. And the first big day that we had a thousand extras, I think we got to work at 3 a.m. and started dressing extras. We'd pre-fit a lot of them, we'd pre-fit the uniforms, but we had a lot of people coming in that day. And I like to, when an extra comes in, you look at them and say, okay, what is your character? So it's kind of fun. It's like you give every extra their 15 minutes of attention to get them dressed and figure out their character. You look good. Thank you. You're done. Nothing else? No. All right. The performances of these extras were incredible. I mean, they were truly horrified, and there was nothing in the sky. In Titanic, when they were trying to break open that door, and everyone was just, that's what we're going for. <laughs> It's amazing how committed they became, and I think everybody shared this truth. They're like, oh my god, we're in a Jurassic Park movie, you guys. And we all just kind of became kids for a day. <laughs> and it just I haven't made enough of these movies to not be really enthusiastic all the time. So when you get me on a set with a thousand people who are all running from, you know flying dinosaurs, there's an infectious energy to that. And cut! Cut it! <laughs> I don't think that anyone is ever going to stop being obsessed with dinosaurs <laughs> at all. And, and so these movies, I think, in a way, will always be relevant. But I think this movie, in particular, at this moment, is very timely. It's almost like a cautionary tale. We see the consequences of ethics not being as developed as technology. Which was always Michael Crichton's dream. He took a very moral interest in his own story about just because we can invent something, should we? And that was a big theme of the first film, and I think that really echoes throughout Jurassic World. And it's a fine line to walk, and I think that's why me, as a fan of Jurassic Park, I feel comfortable knowing that it's in the hands of Colin, because he is also a fan. To be able to be surrounded by people who were so thrilled, they knew it was a special time, they knew it was a special moment. You know, we kind of feel like we snuck into the party. This is so fun. Right. You know how fun this is? This is so fun. And action! I feel like I was a child getting to make a movie with, you know, all the big lights and the cameras. That spirit that we had on set, I, I think, is infused into the movie, and I think you feel it when you watch it.